Well, hey, we are jumping in to Jonah this week. We're going to continue in that. And wouldn't you know it, we're three weeks into Jonah and we are one verse into the book of Jonah. Well, I have great news for you today. Are you ready for this? We are officially going to get into verse two. Woo! I know, I know. You guys are so, so excited about that. But I want to tell you this morning, there is a temptation that's going to occur right here in this room. Everybody's like, ooh. But there is a temptation that you and I will face when it comes to a message like we're going to hear today and for what God has kind of put on me. I know that there is a tension that will hit each and every one of us here this morning. And I'm going to tell you what it is on the front end so that you can just be ready for it so that when it kind of hits you, when that moment occurs in your life, you're ready. You've kind of pre-decided your plan of action. You're going to battle it, but you're going to conquer it, okay? Here's the tension that we will all face is that far too often— we will hear the voice of God for someone else much more clearly than we will hear it for ourselves. Often, we will hear the voice of God for someone else much more clearly than we will ever hear it for ourselves. It's very typical for somebody to ask, do you guys record your sermons? Because, you know, my son really needed to hear this message today. Like, you know, I, I've got a coworker and they've been telling me and I've just been trying to tell them, I'm trying to get through to them and say, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. You know what? If you said it from the stage, then I could just share it with them. They need to hear this. And while I think there is a lot of wisdom that gets shared from up front, whether it's here or some other places, what I think is that far too often we are much more eager to listen for the voice of God for somebody else. And we are much more interested in making a, an action plan for somebody else than we are to get focused and get in tune with what God is trying to do to each and every one of us. And so it's easy for us to come in here and for, for us to do sermons that say, you know, husbands, you should love your wives. And wives are going, see, did you hear him? Did you hear him up there? You're supposed to love your wife. And then it's easy for, for husbands to hear the sermon that says, well, wives, you're supposed to submit to your husband. Your husband jabs back. He goes, did you hear that? Did you hear that? You're supposed to submit to me. And kids, you, you love it whenever the whole honor your father and mother thing comes up. Because if, if you're like me, my dad, like, I think our love language is just like a smack on the back of the head. He'd call him a paya. Like, he's not here, but he'll, he'll tell you it's a real thing. He'll just pop you on the back of the head and say, see, see, hear that? You're supposed to honor your father and mother. I'm like, okay, you're right. You're right. But see, it's very easy for us to hear the voice of God for somebody else than it is for us to hear it in our lives. And it, the, the list can go on and on and on and on. But here's what I want us to know. Is that when that tension arises in your life, when that moment occurs in your life that you think, you know what? Somebody else needs to hear this. Somebody else needs to really get a grip on this. I want you to be careful. Because it just might be in that moment, that's the time that God is trying to communicate something to you. God has been trying to get through to you, and you've been so busy listening for somebody else that you haven't been listening to what God has been trying to communicate to you. So we're going to jump in this morning. We're going to continue in the book of Jonah. The book started out this way. This is what kind of Tom looked at last week. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. And if you weren't here last week, I encourage you, you can go back and listen, northfieldchurch.net. You can find it on Facebook as well. Corey's got that going up for you. But you can go back and listen to that because the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. And then this is what the word of the Lord says. He says, get up, and go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, you see all throughout Scripture these moments where God speaks to his people, where God gives instructions to his people. And if you are a firsthand witness of that moment where God speaks, ooh, it is a powerful moment. It is a mighty moment because it's in those moments that God speaks and things happen. That it's not just words that fall on deaf ears, but it is God speaking and it is people moving. And the challenge that Jonah gets, we find it in just four small words. The challenge was this, get up and go. Four small words, but one big challenge for Jonah. He says, get up and go. Now, when you look back at verse 1, it says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. That word, word there is simply translated meaning instructions. Now, these instructions came to Jonah. And if you're in Jonah's shoes, you can kind of see where there was a tension that he faced in this because typically Jonah was the one who gave instructions. Jonah, being the prophet of God, being the voice of God, he would be the one that would receive a word and then he would go and he would go tell everybody else what to do. 
Wouldn't you love to be a prophet? Oh my goodness. Those of you who didn't say anything, Dan, I saw Dan was like, yes. Like looking on his phone, he's like, yes. I would love to be a prophet of God. You mean I just get to tell people what to do? How many of you, be honest, you would love it if that was your calling from God? Please, just, I said, Cammie Morin right there. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm not scared to say your name. Get out of here. Come on. We all would love it. I would love it. If my job was to just go tell everybody else all the ways that they have done things wrong and how they need to fix it. Oh my goodness. That is like living the dream. But what did I say earlier? The tension we face is we will often hear the voice of God for somebody else more clearly than we will hear it for ourselves. And so Jonah, in this kind of prophet mode, he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. what do you mean get up and go? Like, what do you mean this is my calling? I, I don't understand this. And what we need to realize is this. I don't want to be a downer this morning. But your calling from God, my calling from God, our church's calling from God will always call you to leave the comfortable place where you know everything. Simply put, God will always call you to the place where you are no longer dependent on you. And this is scary. This is the part that we don't like. This is the part that we go, mm, I would much prefer to just kind of snuggle up in my little corner of the world where I know everything where I know all the next steps, where I know all of the instructions, where I know how God works, where I know what comes next, where I, where I, where I have got it figured out. And the tension that we face in that is we make plans for our lives. We plan God's plans for our life. I love in Anna's communion talk just this morning that you see all of the ways that you try to plan the world, and you try to be the one that directs the traffic and all the movement in your life, that you get so wrapped up in how God is going to work for you that you forget that your calling that you've been given is to work for God. And so if we're being honest, if we're putting ourselves in Jonah's shoes, get up and go, it's probably one of the last things that we want to hear. We think, I don't want to get up and go. God, I want you to come here and stay. That, that sounds way better. You just come here and stay. You come into my world and you do things the way that I want to. As you look back at famous callings in scripture, can you imagine how some of these would have gone? If you imagine God going to Noah and saying, Noah, I need you to build me a boat. I need you to build me an ark. It's going to rain. It's going to flood. Things are going to get a little crazy, but you're the guy. You're the one that I need to build me a boat. Can you imagine the story if Noah went, yeah. I don't really do the whole ark thing, God. Like, you got something else? Can we do, can we figure something else out? Or if you look at Abraham, God says, Abraham, here's what I need from you. I need you to leave your hometown. I need you to leave your family. I need you to go because Abraham, you are going to be the father of a great nation. Can you imagine if Abraham went, mm, I don't do the whole wandering thing. I don't really do the whole like nomad thing. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Can you imagine if Moses, if Moses, God says, Moses, here's what I need. I need you to go back to Egypt because you're the one that's going to lead my people out of slavery. And if Moses said, God, I've already been there. I've already done that. I've done the whole Egypt thing. I just don't want to do it again. Can you imagine if Mary, the mother of Jesus, God says, you, Mary, you, Mary, you are going to birth the savior of the world here, right now. She goes, mm, I don't really do the whole virgin birth thing. It's not for me. I think you could find somebody else that's just much more equipped. Maybe they can handle it. Can you imagine Jesus? If Jesus replied, I don't do crosses. I don't do crosses. That's not really my thing. I think there's another way. I think there's another plan. God, I, I don't think that what you're wanting is what I need to do. You see, I'm now a parent of a newborn child. I, I've got a picture of him. He's looking quite adorable there. <coughs> yep. I knew you would uh, appreciate that. And, and so in life, uh, Haley and I have been given a, a much different get up and go type of calling. Those of you, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Don't go there yet. Don't go there yet. We're still on the cute side, okay? He's going to earn that, that nasty picture that you just saw here in a second. But you see, this, this cute little man has given us a, a, a different type of get up and go calling. And I'm telling you right now, this child has a gift. And I know what you're thinking. 
Everybody thinks their kid has a gift. Everybody thinks their kid is gifted, but you don't understand. You don't know this child, okay? See, this child right here keeps this face all the time until one moment of every single day. And it's that moment that each and every one of you long for. It's that time when the day winds down and what you've been wanting all day is for you to just hit the bed. You know what I'm talking about. Get into bed, get on the pillow. You do that stretch and then, ah. Some of y'all about to go to sleep right now just thinking about it. You're like, yes, rainy day, that's all you want to do. But I'm telling you, it seems like every single day, that stretch, ah, moment, hit it. That's what we get. What? No, not me. That's what we get. (laughs) Right there. That so lovable little face turns into, uh, and I have to admit, it is my kid, and so that's still kind of a lovable face. It's kind of cute. You see the scrunch right here. It's all, it's all good. But it's in that moment. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what you guys would think of me as a parent if I just picked up the monitor, you know, hit the, hit the little microphone button you talk into and say, hey, baby Jack, um, yeah, mom and I don't really do diapers after 11, so <laughs> you're on your own. You know, maybe cry like 6, 6.30. If you could push it to 7, that'd be great. But we'll handle this in the morning. You see, I think when it comes to the callings that God places on our life, it'll always be easier to stay where you are. It'll always be easier to do things the way that you've been doing them. It'll always be easier to stay in the place where you are dependent on you. And and we've all been here before. We've all had those moments where we go, God, I'm, I'm here. I'm here to do your will. God, your will be done on here. Use me, send me wherever you need to go. But God, please don't let it be in the three-year-old class. Like, (laughs) anywhere, anywhere but there. Or, God, I I am your vessel, Lord, I am your vessel. Just send me out, send me out. But if you could, like, not teenagers, just not not them. You know, I'll I'll go younger. Like, I I love babies. I love the nursery. You know, I'll even even lead a small group, but just just not teenagers. Just don't put me there. You see, we get into this habit of telling God all the things that we want to do, or more so we tell God all of the things that we can't do and feel like we can't do. But what we really need to be doing is we need to be people who lean into the one who tells us what we can do through him. That through him, we can do all things through him who gives us strength. You see, I think as a society and as a church, I think we get too complacent in the thought that we say, God, I can't do this or I won't do this, and so I'm going to serve where I'm gifted. And instead of what we don't realize is that we have been given a calling by the one who tells us that we can do all things through him. And I fear that most of us live our lives not believing that, not leaning in to the fact that that is true. If you'd have told me 12 years ago One day, Trent, you're going to stand on a stage in front of people and you're going to preach the Word of God. Two things would have happened. I would have laughed, and if you knew me 12 years ago, you would have laughed. (laughs) Because you would have thought, there's no way. There's no way that somebody like him could do that. There's no way that somebody like him would be worthy of doing that. And I thought the exact same thing. I thought there is no way on God's green earth, that he is going to call me to do any type of ministry. If you knew the way that I was in middle school, if you knew the way that I was in high school, but God's plans and my plans were two very different things. You see, I felt this calling to ministry and specifically into student ministry when I was a senior in high school. It was kind of one of those camp moments, and so after the fact, you're like, was that really real? Was it? Uh, it was. Okay, it was. Very good. And so in that, I, I thought, okay, God, if this is where you're pulling me to, if this is where we're going, then, then that's awesome. I'm in. I want to do this. And I got an opportunity to preach. I, I, I kid you not, I, I think my in-laws will be here in second service, so they will be able to confirm how bad this preaching experience was for me. We, it was the Sunday night service. If you remember Sunday night service, you knew it was kind of like, eh, it was hit or miss anyway. But they gave, they gave our students the opportunity to, to speak and kind of to lead the service. And so I was the one that got to preach that night. I kid you not, my wrap up was me here at my notes, looking at the clock, and it was 6.32. The whole worship service started at 6. 
And I had, we had done like songs, we had taken communion, and then message. I was through my notes at 6.32 looking at the clock going, well, I'm not going to lie. I've flown through my notes and I don't really have anything else to say, so I'm going to pray for us and we're going to be done. Some of you are like, hey, you can do that right now, and I, we're good. I'm good with it. I'm good with it, man. I'm not going to judge at all. But it was in that moment that I go, God, there's no way you're going to use me in ministry. There's no way. Like, look at me. I can barely communicate. I can barely speak. I, I avoided public speaking. I avoided upfront presentations. God, how are you going to use somebody like me? And you see, it's always easy for us to hear that calling of get up and go and think, no. I think it's just going to be easier if I stay where I am. It's going to be easier if I stay right here. But I want you to know something this morning. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter how old you are, you have what it takes to answer God's calling for your life. You may hear that and go, mm, I don't think you're talking to me. But I want you to know I'm talking to you. You have what it takes to answer God's calling for your life. I can't answer the question of what God's calling for your life is, but I know that when you receive that calling and you step out in faith and you get up and go, you've got what it takes to answer the call. Jesus tells us this in John 14, 16 and 17. He says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, known as the spirit of truth. He says the world cannot accept him. Because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you can know him, for he lives with you and he will be in you. You see, you have what it takes to answer the calling of God. Paul puts it this way in Romans 8 verse 11. He says, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. You. you see, you have what it takes to answer God's calling for your life. Paul says it again in Ephesians 2.22. He says, and in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling, listen, in which God lives by his spirit. You see, you have what it takes to answer God's calling for your life. And it is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I know when the Holy Spirit comes up, we get kind of weirded out because we think, well, I don't know how the Holy Spirit works. I don't know all the ways that, it, that it's supposed to work in my life. And trust me, I get it. I've been there before. I understand what you're thinking. But here is what I want you to know. That the Holy Spirit is this third person of God. It's this third part of the Trinity. It's not third in line. It's not third in, in its order of importance, but I think it's just third in the way that we communicate it because as you look at the narrative of Scripture, it is like the last one, the third one to kind of be revealed to us more fully. You see, in the beginning, we have God the Father who is revealed to us in creation. And Scripture tells us that the others were there, but it's in this creation moment that we see this God, the maker, the creator of heaven and earth. And then all throughout the Old Testament, you see this, this, these prophecies, these talking about one that will come, one that is going to come. And what you see as you get into the New Testament, as you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these gospels that tell us about this person of Jesus, this God in the flesh who is with us. But then Jesus himself even begins to speak of someone who will come after him, someone who will live inside of us, someone who will be with us. And if you get this, he says that will even allow us to do greater things than if Jesus himself were with us. And you go, wait, what? Like better than Jesus? Better than Jesus being with us? He says, yes. Better than the Son of God, God in the flesh here beside you because it's better than that. Because it is God himself, the very Spirit of God living inside of you and what the Holy Spirit is, is it's all the power, it's all the wonder, it's all the fullness, all of the greatness, all of the authority of God the Father and Jesus the Son living inside of you, 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 living inside of you. And so as Paul says, he goes, the same power, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is the same power and the same spirit that takes up residence in you. And you want to tell me right now that you're scared of three-year-olds? You have the very spirit that raised Christ from the dead. What is it that you do not have that these three-year-olds have? Because I'll tell you what it is that you do have. 
What you do have is you do have an opportunity to introduce young people into the family of God. You have the opportunity to introduce them, and you get to change the trajectory of their entire life by introducing them to what it is and what it means to be the church. But you're scared of three-year-olds? No, 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 no. You have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You have the power of the Spirit living inside of you, and you're scared of teenagers? I understand it. But you're scared of teenagers? No, no, no. You see, what you have is you have the opportunity in that moment with working with students— is you have an opportunity to be like Christ in the fact that you get to speak on behalf of God in the flesh to them. You get to be very present. You get to be very tangible. You get to be the very person that they go to in a time of need, but you're worried and you're scared of what they might think and how they might act. No, you have the power of the Holy Spirit living in your life. You don't think that you can go on a mission trip this summer? You think, well, I don't know how to use power tools. I I, I don't know how to build a house. I don't know how to do construction. Are you kidding me? You've got the power of the Holy Spirit taking up residence in your body. Do you think a lack of knowledge compares to the fact that God can't work in you? Do you think that a lack of knowledge is going to stop God from working in and through your life on that mission trip? No, because what you have the opportunity to do is you have the opportunity to mend homes and you get the opportunity to renovate homes in the same way that Jesus is renovating each and every one of our hearts. That you get to do very physically what it is that God is doing very spiritually to this earth and to this world. And you think, I can't, I can't do it. Oh, you can. Trust me, you can because you have God himself living inside of you. Bottom line for this morning, if there's one takeaway that you're going to get today, it is this. That is, if God has called you to it, he will equip you through it. If God has called you to it, he will equip you through it. We said it at the beginning. The challenge and the calling that we're going to get from God is always going to pull us to a place where we are no longer dependent on us. But the good thing is, we can be dependent on the one who lives inside of us. We can be dependent on the one who lives through us and guides us each and every day. And so, you know what the best part is? Is even in the days that we don't feel like God is with us. You know, there's the head knowledge of the Spirit living inside of us. But I know that there are days that you go, it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't feel like God is here. It doesn't feel like God is working. And we've all had those days. But the best part is that Paul addresses these moments as well. In Romans 8, 26 and 27, he says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, not just in the big days, not just in the big moments, but he helps us in our weakness. He goes, for there are days that we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through groaning too deep for words. And he searches our hearts and he knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. Let me simplify. God is praying for you. God is praying for you. Can you fathom that? The fact that God believes in you so much, so much so that he prays on behalf of you. That on the days that you feel like you are at your weakest, that on the days that you are at your lowest, on the days where you are like, I don't even understand how God can be working in somebody like me. It's in those moments that the spirit of God believes in you so much that he prays on behalf of you. And in those moments where we pray, God, I want your kingdom to reign more fully on earth. I pray that your kingdom come, your will be done. God, in those moments, he's turning back and he's praying for you. And he goes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that happen. I'm going to give you an opportunity to demonstrate to the world the ways that you are bringing my kingdom here. That it is not me doing the work, but it is me through you and the opportunities that you have. Do you see the way these two things are coming together? That it is not just God's responsibility, but it is our responsibility in tandem with God to bring about those two things that seem so distant, close to one another. And it's in those opportunities that God gives us that we bring God's kingdom here. But you know, I think there's an obstacle that we all face. There's an obstacle that we face in the same way that Jonah did. And I think it's the ways that God has worked in our past. 
I think the biggest obstacle that we face sometimes as to what God is going to do sometime in the future is we rely too heavily on what God has already done in the past. You see it play out in Jonah's story because these other verses, they, they indicate this is not Jonah's first day on the prophet job. He didn't just show up like, hey, I'm checking in for work today. Like, what do we got? Like, this is my first time doing this. No, it seems like Jonah has worked before, but somehow this calling was different. This was different. And so Jonah does what you and I do when something feels different from God. We think, well, this, this can't be God. God hasn't worked this way before. God, God's not working in the same way that he normally does. So this obviously can't be God. And what I fear in my own life and what I fear for the life of our church and for the church as a whole is that our biggest obstacle to experiencing God move tomorrow is we lean too heavily and we cling too tightly to what God did yesterday. That we think we've got God figured out, that we kind of put God in the box, we kind of draw up all the plays, but what we don't realize is that God is trying to do maybe a new thing through you and through me and through each and every one of our lives. And the greatest hindrance to us experiencing something brand new is that we get so wrapped up and the last thing God did that we're not willing to move to the next thing. And what I ask is, we kind of wind down today, is could it be that God is calling you? As we looked at last week and listening to that voice of God, that this week I want to put in front of you that could it be that God is calling you to maybe something different than he has called you to before? Could it be that God is calling you to something that looks different or feels different, but it is still God who is calling you you see, as we look at Jonah's story, God says to him, he says, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and cry out against it for their wickedness has come up before me. And the great advantage that you and I have is we know the end of the story, right? Jonah does things his way for a little while, but ultimately he gets called into what God had initially planned. And God goes to the great city of Nineveh. Spoiler alert if you haven't read it. But he goes to the great city of Nineveh and he preaches just as God commanded him. And it's in that moment that what you see is a revival takes place in Nineveh. That a place that was known and seen for their evil and for their wickedness, they turn from their wicked ways and they turn back to God. And it's all because of what? It's all because Jonah actually got up and went. It's all because Jonah actually did the very thing that Jonah was called to do. And, and, and a thought that just kind of hit me yesterday, I hope it, it makes sense to you, but have you ever realized this, that a tree never bears fruit for the benefit of the tree? That if an apple tree is going to grow an apple, who is that apple good for? Is it good for the tree or is it good for the one who's going to consume the apple? If an orange tree bears an orange, who is the orange good for? Is it good for the tree or is it good for somebody that's going to consume the orange? You see, as we look at Jonah's life and as we look at our lives, as we look at what the fruits of the Spirit are, their love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, as we look at these fruits of the Spirit, let me ask you this. Who are those fruits good for? Are they good for you, the one who bears those fruits? Or are they good for somebody else who will take those fruits and consume those fruits and use those fruits and feel those fruits? You see, oftentimes I think we are like Jonah, that we get so caught up in our world and the things that we can put together and the things that we can accrue and the things that we can make and the things that we can control, that what we do is we lose sight of the fact that we are put here to bear fruit for the benefit of somebody else. And as you look at Jonah's life, and as you look at your own life, my question for you is this, that what if instead of using the fruit we bear for the good of the one who bears it. We took the fruit that we bear for the good of someone else. And I wonder, what would your life look like if you took the focus off of you and put the focus on somebody else? What would your family look like if everyone in your family decided, you know what, today I'm not gonna look out for me, but I'm gonna look out for somebody else? What would it look like in our church if we became a group of people that were known not for the things we did in here, but we became a church that were known for the things that we did outside of these walls? What would it look like right here in Sumner County if we could start a movement of getting the focus off of ourselves 
and on to somebody else. Guys, can you imagine the ripple effect that it would have on this world if we right here just decided, you know what? I'm going to stop living for me and I'm going to start living for somebody else. Next week, we're going to go to Nineveh. Next week, we're going to go to the place that we never thought God would call us to. And when he does, we're going to run in the opposite direction. But until we get there, as we kind of close and I give you some next steps and some action steps this morning, maybe for you, you go, you know what? I've been running far too long from what God has for my life. I've been running far too long for what God has called me to do. And you go, you know what? That life in the spirit thing, that sounds pretty good. And what Peter tells us in Acts 2 says that we receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. That in our calling, what we do is we repent, we turn from our old ways and we say, you know what, God, you're the one that's going to be in control from now on. And through the simple act of baptism and giving our lives over to Christ, what we receive is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Maybe this is the week that you go, you know what? I want to receive that gift. I want to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I want to start living and I want to start bearing fruit, not for me, but for somebody else. Maybe this morning you don't have an action step, but maybe this morning it's continuing like we talked about last week. That you're continuing to listen for the voice of God, and maybe today's the day that you get outside of just you asking, God, where can you help me? But maybe today's the day that you come find one of us in the green room, or you find Lee who's standing right there in the middle every week right here. Or you go find Jim over in the green room, and you say, can you pray for me? I, I felt God wanting to do something, but I don't know what that is, and so can you pray for me? You know, maybe today is the day that you get up and go. Maybe you know what you've been running from. You didn't need somebody up here to tell you, but you knew, man, do we have to talk about this today? Yeah. Maybe today is the day that you quit running and you start leaning in to what God has for you and for your life. Because I can promise you this. If God has called you to it, he will equip you through it. Let me pray for you this morning and we'll be dismissed. Father God, I'm thankful for today. I'm thankful for your son, Jesus, and the example that he has given each and every one of us. God, I pray that we are people who will bear fruit, not for the benefit of ourselves, but we will bear fruit for the good of somebody else. Because that is exactly what your son, Jesus, did for us. God, I pray for the opportunities that you're going to put in front of somebody that is sitting in this room this week. And they will hear it as a calling from you and a challenge from you to get up and go. And at the end of the story, we will know that they got up and went. Father, I'm thankful for the ways that you love us. I'm thankful for what you've done here in this church and what you'll continue to do. And I pray that we will always be more focused on what you will do tomorrow than what you have already done in the past. God, we love you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.